Whenever God is about to destroy the evil altars, he finds a man with a superior altar to do, to do the job. The other was a man of God from Judah to Bethel by the word of the Lord. Friends, I come to you tonight by the word of the Lord. That's why I know many, many, many are going to be delivered tonight. And Jehoram stood by the altar to burn incense. Then he cried out against the altar. It's very interesting that Jehoram, the, uh, the, king, the, king of, the king himself, was the culprit to the evil that Ota was generating in the nation. Because the king himself had sold himself to that evil altar because the king himself was the attendant to the altar. In the laws of altars, you, you find out in my new book, The Battle of Altars, that every altar demands to have a human attendant. And the most important feature of an altar is that it always has a human being connected to it. Every altar cannot survive without needing, without having a human attendant to attend to the altar. And so, so in this altar had the king himself attending to it. What is, it. what is informative to me is that when the prophet comes, he does not address the king, which would be the natural thing to do. The head of state is there, which means the, the security protocol, the secret service were with him. I mean, all the pomp of political power was with the king. And yet when the prophet of God comes, God does not allow him to address the king. He tells him to address the altar. Tonight is about God addressing the altar. That has held you back, delayed you. Allowed you to live around repetitive rituals that are not the kingdom. You keep making five steps on detecting this rituals in your life that keeps happening. Because altars are places of ritual. So when you see a ritual, a ritual is a repetitive activity or behavior. Whenever you see a repetitive activity or behavior, more often than not, there's an altar. And then the activity or the ritual can tell you whether the altar is a righteous altar or an evil altar. Are you catching what I'm saying? And can I submit to you, it's the last night, and knowing that how, this, how conniving these altars are, and how much they don't want to leave you tonight, I can, can I submit to you, the altars are going to try to put you to sleep tonight. Some of you are already struggling with your eyes. The altar want to shut your eyes because they want to stay. They know who is in the building. But trust me, if you just fight a little longer, if you fight for one, more, for one more hour to stay awake and hear what this black man has to say by the Spirit of God, you are going to have the most sound sleep you've ever had for generations. But you're going to go to sleep knowing that I'm free and so are my descendants. Amen. So the man of God arrives, Pastor Chris, and he cried out against the altar. The prophet is not is sent to the altar because altars are living entities in the spirit. They have a life outside of their attendant. As a matter of fact, if you understand the altar, the attendant draws his power from the altar. So that's why God sends him to the altar. It's the power station of the activity. Uh, the human attendant is the, is, the, is the orange on the tree, not the root. Because the altar is the root creating the fruit. Otter, otter, that says the Lord. That's what's going to happen when I begin to go through, call these evil otters out of you, one after the other. God told me what to do under his authority. Otter, otter, that says the Lord. Behold, a child, Josiah by name, shall be born to the house of David. And on you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places. The priests of the what? You know, in the book of Ephesians, Paul says, we do not wrestle against what? Flesh and blood, but against what? Principies and powers and rulers of darkness. And then what? Spiritual what? Wickedness what? In high places. You see, because of Gentile thinking, not Hebraic understanding, where our translators in some vision, they take heaven, high places, and they turn it into heavenly places, and you lose the technology. 
Because the high places are, are not, the high places is not heavenly places. The high places are altars. So Satan has a whole section of angels, fallen angels. All they do is work around altars. They are the one who open the door then they re- for the rest of them to work. Spiritual wickedness, high places. High places where altars are placed because in high places are synonymous with altars because all altars were placed on elevation stages because an altar is a stage. Look at me. Um, an, an altar is a stage because it's designed to be, you know, it's, okay. See, an altar is a platform or a stage. Have you noticed every altar or stage is designed the same way? Where the attendants are below, the altar is above. Why? Because the, because the purpose of that is so that you, you, the attendants can look up to the idol or look up to God. All altars were, all, all altars were always built on high places. Because they desire, the purpose was if you put an, an idol there, then by psychology and by geographic, geographical location of the altar, everybody who comes to worship must look up. Because all worship is looking up. Come on, somebody. He says, altar, he, he prophesies to this altar. He's, he's, he's speaking against his altar. He prophesies against it. And, he, and, and, and a judgment of God comes upon this altar. You know, God s- says to the altar, you're going to be split apart. Man, either this man is crazy or he knows something. Who talks to an altar unless the altar is alive? It will be like, you know, come and say, it will be insanity to talk to an altar if he had no capacity to hear what he was saying. He spoke to the altar, completely ignored the king. He only spoke to the king when the king got upset. Because whenever you destroy an altar, the attendants are going to go crazy. That's what I had somebody tell me, I don't know what happened to them. Ever since I got delivered from this altar, he says, my family members I used to get along with, they are now attacking me. I said, because now the altar knows you're not part of it. Even our daughter, even our, even our own daughter, the very week she got delivered from this evil altar, the very week she got delivered, maybe we, she said, my daughter was living with me. We never fought. He says, my daughter all of a sudden couldn't stand me and left the house. Father of altars. Talk to me, somebody. Check this out. Are you with me, somebody? He prophesied. And he said, and he gave a sign that day, verse 3, saying, this is a sign which the Lord has spoken. Surely the altar shall split apart. Someone said, the altar shall split apart. Someone said, that's good news for me. Surely the evil altar shall split apart and the ashes on it shall be poured out. So it came to pass. When King Jehoram heard the saying of the man of God who cried against the altar in Bethel, that he stretched out his hand from the altar, saying, Arrest him. Then his hand, which is stretched out towards him. Very interesting what the Bible says. The king was about to strike the prophet, is it right? But the, it, it's an interesting expression the Bible uses. For the Bible says, he stretched his hand to strike him from the altar. The knowledge, what the Holy Spirit is trying to project is, he was trying to strike him in the power he used to get from the altar. But when the altar is judged, the attendant is useless. He tried to strike him from the altar and the Bible says he got arrested. He's he's, he's got what? Arrested. God is sending angels tonight. He has sent angels to arrest every evil altar in your bloodline tonight. What used to work against you will never work again. Somebody, get, what used to work against you, you never work again. Where is that Nigerian man, the Mr. Mensa? Where are you? Is this a Mensa? Are you the Mensa man? Yes. You talked to me yesterday. The Lord talked to me about last one. Just came to see me last night. He talked to me about you. He said, you know, yeah, because you said you, you're always fighting these things trying to kill you. Is that right? Is that right? It's been going on for years, right? Okay. 
for what? Three years. Three years. Okay? And the Lord came to me and he said, Mensur, here's Mensur's situation. And the Lord took me and he said to me, Mensur, he said, Mensur is being harassed because the spirits that have been assigned to him, um, he called them this, um, what did he call them? What is a sentry? You know, sentry? Sentry. That's a sentry, eh? Sent sentinel. Yeah, what's the word sentinel? Somebody who Sentinels, no, the, sen the word sentinel. Sentinel, you know what I mean? It's like spirits that look after you. They look sentinel. They watch. The Lord said to me that there was a grandfather in your bloodline who was a priest. And this, the reason why you've been fighting is because you carry the same seer gift he had. The enemy knows you can see by the spirit of the seer that's in you. Your great grandfather had it, but he gave it, but the Lucifer, but he didn't know God, so the enemy used it. And now they are after you to take his place. Because the altars were actually traveling the bloodline to looking, looking for the next attendant. Come on, somebody. And that's your situation. But the Lord said to him, He said, While you are praying tomorrow, I'm going to set him free and you'll never have that trouble again. There is nothing worse, people, than being alive and hating to go back to sleep. Because we live and work during the day so we can sleep and rest at night. But many of you, you work in the day and you work on the bed. Fighting all kinds of stuff. You wake up feeling fatigued because your dreams is warfare. Are you catching what I'm saying? But God is going to deliver us tonight. Amen? So I want to quickly give you a definition of an altar. Are you ready for this? What is an altar? What is this platform called an altar? Amen? And I, and, and, and I, and I, wanna, I want just to, to get this down. Amen? I'm reading from my book, but I think it should be on there. I think it's the second slide, my kept. Amen? An altar. Okay? Say it with me. So it, 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 I just want to say it with me. See, an altar... Is a supernatural landing strip, a power station, a consecrated place, a place of exchange, a place of sacrifice, a table of fellowship, a place where covenants are made and sustained. It's a spiritual platform where spirits, God, angels, or demons land. It is where humanity meets with divinity. These are altars. And they are so important. Also, here's another one. An altar, said with me, an altar is a system of authorization for promises, vows, and agreements between divinity and humanity. Now say in modern language, an altar is an API between the natural and the spirit world. Now some of you may not understand what an API is. API is those who are in technology understand it. But most of you don't, an API, you use the APIs, but some of you don't even know what you're using an API. But an API goes, the Holy Spirit of Francis, an API is your modern version of an altar in, an, in the world of technology. An API, API stands for Applied ap uh, uh, Application um, um, Programming Interface. What it means is this. For instance, my website, I have got products to sell. Is that right? Is that right? I've got books to sell. Amen? But, I, but if you go to my website, I can't sell you books just because you went to my website. So I do need somebody who owns a payment gateway. It's PayPal. So on my website... You're going to find the logo of PayPal, not because PayPal owns my website. It's there to show me that my website has a, is connecting, is interfacing with what? PayPal. There's an exchange between my website and what? PayPal. And for using the altar or the exchange of PayPal, PayPal has the legal right to levy me a fee. Oh, come on, somebody. 
and that's why I pay PayPal 2.5 percent of whatever you buy on my website because I'm using their API. Authors are exactly the same way. They link two different worlds together. That place of meeting or that place of the API is the author. I guess what I'm saying. And the Satan has a legal right to tax you based upon that exchange. And that's why today God is going to deal with that, who is going to deal with this evil APIs, this evil authors that are in our bloodline. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to begin to, I'm going to be calling out a lot of stuff, okay? I'm going to be stopping. I'm going I'm I'm to I'm talk about an evil author, then we, we do deliverance. Is that right? Yes. I, I, that's how God wants us to be done. Amen. Are you ready for this? So understand that in the Bible, there are, there, there are, there are basically two types of altars. Two types of what? Righteous altars and what? And we find this, this dimension of altars in the first book in Genesis chapter 4, when the two sons of, e, of Adam come to build altars. They build what? Altars to the Lord. Is that right? They build altars to the Lord. Uh, they come to bring an offering to the Lord. How did they know that they needed to build an altar? Because God had already shown Adam and Eve on their way out when he killed the animal how to connect with heaven. So now they, they are building two altars. Well, the Bible tells us one was a righteous altar. The other one became an evil altar because Cain would not listen to the Lord. As a matter of fact, the, 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 the nature of an evil altar is, built, is found in chapter 4 of Genesis. And if I was going there, I would tell you how an evil altar, the nature of an evil altar is built, is found in chapter 4. But it suffices to say, for the sake of this service, that we see two types of altars. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact the battle of altars began immediately because before it was over, Abel was dead because of the battle of altars. The first homicide in the Bible is connected to altars. Talk to me, somebody. Are you catch what I'm saying? As a matter of fact, can I submit to you? I don't, I don't want to depress you, but in the last days, there is a lot of Christians who are going to have to give up your life for Jesus. Because in the battle of altars, when it comes to bloodshed, it's always our blood that goes because, watch this now, it's very interesting, very interesting dynamic. In the Bible, you never find the prophets of, you never find, in the Bible, you're going to find that a lot of, a lot of the martyrdom has to do with the fact that, with the fact that a child of God came, a child of God, come on somebody, God allowed them to, to be able to give up their life for the sake of the gospel. Come on, somebody. Amen. So we find that, the, that what happened with Abel, uh, which is where the beginning of martyrdom in the Bible, is going to perpetuate itself because of the battle of these altars. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of altars the Lord wants me to deal with tonight. Amen. And I'm telling you, some of you are going to find that a lot of the things happening in your life right now are because of some of the things I'm going to be calling out. So I'm going to take you through a couple of evil altars. Can I do that? Okay, can I do that? And as, when I call on an evil altar, then I pray. We pray together. Amen? Come on, somebody. It doesn't matter if you don't identify with it. Just pray with me because sometimes the devil is a master of hiding. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Satan is a master of masks. I mean, I mean we, are in a, we, are, we are in one of those services. It doesn't matter what's called out. You jumping in the line. Why? Because just in case. You're like, just in case. I, I, you know, he's in there and I don't want to cut him home. I don't want to take him home with me. I'm going to. Well, I got to put that thing out of me right now. So whatever. So the first, the first evil altar, and I would, the first evil altar is Balaam's altar. It's the altar of Balaam. Numbers 23, verse 11 to 14. Now, you don't have to put it on the board. Just write it down. Because when I call out the altars, I'll tell you what the altar does, and then we're going to pray. Okay? Come on, somebody. Amen. The altar of Balaam. Come on, somebody. Amen. Well, who was Balaam? Balaam, uh, Dr. Linda, was uh, one of the most well-known sorcerers in the Bible. Come on, somebody. He was one, actually, according to the book of Joshua, Balaam was the son, was the father of Janis and Jambres, who, 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 who challenged Moses. When Moses. Remember when Moses made a snake? There were two Chaldeans. Janice and Jambres, were well, according to the book of Joshua, they are the two sons of Balaam. Balaam taught them the measure of sorcery. He was a well-known sorcerer in the ancient world. Are you catch what I'm saying? So the author of Balaam is the author of witchcraft. Come on, some. It's the author of what? 
witchcraft. So right, witchcraft, magic, and spells, and incantations. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I want you to pray this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father. Now, here's what I want you to do. What I want to do. Amen? When I say pull it out, come on, somebody. I'm going to pray with you, but when I say pull it out, I'm going to tell you. Because your hand, when you put it out, your hand will become the hand of God. Amen? And the reason, and God told me, when you finish the evil altars, he says, replace them because nature hates a vacuum. He says, now I want to call out the righteous altars, okay? And then when we come to righteous altars, whenever I call them out, you say, put it in. So it's going to be put it out and then later put it in. God says, I'm going to put, come on somebody, amen? Oh, hallelujah. Amen? Are you catching what I'm saying? Amen. This is real stuff. This is real deliverance. The angels of God are here to deal with this stuff. Okay? So I want everybody. So you, you be, you're going to go. Today, today you're going to be like, you're going to feel like you're in a Catholic church in the sense that you'll be up and down, up and down, up and down. You remember the Catholic church? Uh, la, 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 ba, ba. I mean, when I was in Catholic church, I was like, can't the priest make up his mind? Should we sit? Should we stand? <laughs> Going to a Catholic church was a full workout. Dun, 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 dun. I'm telling you, after an hour, man, you, you lose weight in a Catholic church. So today, please forgive me. It's going to feel like a Catholic church, but we're doing the work of the Lord. Amen? Amen? So right now, stand up. Stand up right now and pray this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, the battle of altars has already begun and the devil is losing. Heavenly Father, Everything, Everything. I have anything, anything I have in common, have in common. with the spirit, the, spirit. the altar, the altar. Of, witchcraft. of witchcraft in my bloodline, in my soul, or in my DNA. I'm asking you, God, that as I'm in your presence, as the angels around me, Heavenly Father, I renounce the altar of Balaam, the altar of witchcraft. From this day forward, there'll be no witchcraft, no sorcery, no magic, no incantation that can ever control my life. During the day or when I'm sleeping, witchcraft who have no altar, who have no landing place within my DNA, within my bloodline, within my soul, in Jesus' name, put it out. Sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Jezebel's altar. Jezebel's altar. And some of you eat that. Come on, somebody. The Bible actually calls Jezebel's altar Jezebel's table. Because an altar is a table because you eat at it. Are you catching what I'm saying? So the Bible uses the terminology Jezebel's table, but an altar is what? A table. In Hebraic understanding, an altar is what? Is a table. So the Bible tells us, amen, in 1 Kings, when Ahab saw Elijah and said to him, are you the one who is bringing disaster on Israel? Elijah said, I have not brought disaster on Israel, but you and your father's household have done by abandoning and rejecting the commandments of the Lord by following Baals. Now when, now send, uh, send and God to me, oh, uh, all Israel on Mount Carmel, together with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the goddess Asherah, who ate at Queen Jezebel's table. Okay? So we know that one of the most aggressive evil authors and spirits in the Bible is the table and the spirit of Jezebel. The spirit of Jezebel is, 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 common, is, such, is such a common spirit in the earth. And its altar is so common that Jesus, when he's talking to the seven churches, has to address the altar of Jezebel in the church. He says, I have one thing against you because you got the altar of Jezebel in you. 
Jezebel loves to come to church. It tells us Jezebel, that spirit likes to operate in the lives of God's people. It's a spirit, it's an altar that hits the, the pure prophetic word of the Lord. It's a spirit of control and manipulation. Talk to me somebody. Amen. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people of God, they love Jesus, but boy, they are manipulative, they are control freaks. Come on, someone. Why do you have to know everybody's business? Because the author of Jezebel is in your soul. There is no news that happens in the church that you don't think you have a right to speak in. You can't be that important. But what did they say? What, I mean, you have to know. It's because the author of Jezebel must control everything. Why did the pastor preach that? Why did he have to say it that way? It is Jezebel speaking inside of you. Come on, somebody. And we are going to be delivered tonight from the author of Jezebel. Talk to me, somebody. I want you to stand up right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Say, Heavenly Father, as I'm in the court of heaven, I demand a deliverance from the spirit of Jezebel and the, Je and the, and the author of Jezebel. I renounce, Lord, this evil altar of witchcraft, manipulation, and control. I'm asking God that in the name of Jesus, you would judge this altar and destroy it over my life once and for all in Jesus name Heavenly Father I repent for anything I have in common with the altar the table of Jezebel in my soul in my DNA or in my bloodline anything that connects me to the altar of Jezebel I renounce it. I renounce it. I reject it. And I ask the blood of Jesus to cleanse me and divorce me from the Jezebel spirit and the altar of Jezebel in Jesus' name. Lord, as this altar, this evil altar comes out of me, I will lose the desire to manipulate anybody. I will lose the desire to try to control everybody in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that the angels are here to drag the altar of Jezebel out of my DNA, out of my soul, out of my bloodline. Pull it now! Pull it, pull it now! Sit down, sit down, sit down. You've never seen a deliverance service like this, but you'll see the fruit. Come on, somebody. <laughs> and the Lord said to me, this is a big one for Americans. This, the next two are, are big ones. He said to me, these are big ones for Americans. The altar of Baal. The altar of Baal. Baal worship in America is rampant. These demonic deities are running America for the most part. Baal is the God that would have stopped the, the destiny of Gideon had God not taught Gideon to destroy the author of Baal in his father's house. Gideon would not have been able to deliver Israel I did not dealt with Baal worship, which lets me know that Baal is the number one deity that stops many of you from coming into destiny. So it seems like it's an ancient God that stops destiny. Because God tells Gideon, even though you have met me, if you don't deal with the author of Baal in your father's house, you are going nowhere. Your prophecies will sound like music that never comes to pass. Early the next morning, Judges 6, 28, 38. Judges 6, 20, 28 to 30. And I'll tell you what, Baal. I'm going to go deeper into Baal. Early the next morning when the men of the city got up, they discovered that the author of Baal was what? 
torn down, and the Asherah, which was beside it, was cut down, and the second bull was offered on the altar which had been built. So they said to one another, who has done this? When they searched about and inquired, they were told, Gideon, the son of Joash, did it. Then the men of the city said to Joash, bring your son so that we, he may be executed because he has torn down the altar of Baal and cut down the Asherah. Amen? That was, you know, the word Baal literally means Lord. So it says it's a deity that tries to replace, to, to, it's a deity that tries to replace the Lordship of Jesus. Baal means Lord. You know, he has, the, 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 you, know, you know, the God Baal in ancient times assumed significant roles by the people who worshipped him. Baal was seen as a god of the storm. He was seen, he, 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 he was, he was seen as the, he was the god of thunder. You know, that the Baal, you know, but also he was the God who, who both created, according to the ancient world, Baal was the God over fertility and sexuality or sexual orientation. So a lot of the sexual confusion in America is because of Baal. Baal was worshipped by homosexuality. He was worshipped by lesbianism. He was worshipping by, I mean, doing all kinds of, that was Baal. Come on, someone. His, amen. And, every, and all other fertility rites are connected to the issue of Baal. Baal, right? You know, and Baal is such, a, is such a prominent God that even Jesus had to deal with Baal in his day. Actually, Jesus was accused of operating in the power of Baal's coming somebody, you know, you know, so Jesus had to deal with this demonic deity. How many know if Jesus is dealing with it, it's a real thing, it's a real force. Are you catching what I'm saying? Amen. That's why in my, my interview with Sidro, I told you that I'm, you know, come on somebody, amen. And I don't want to offend anybody who's a Democrat, but I'm telling you at some point, this political party has become an author of bail. Because I'm telling you every, have you noticed, everything to do with sexuality is promoted by one party. Because that is the language of Baal. He wants to control sexuality, sex, and how you think about the subject of sex and sexuality. That is the essence of Baal worship. Come on, somebody. Amen. You know, some of your children were now confused about their sex. All you have to do, don't try to counsel them. Just cast out Baal. And all of a sudden, they'll get over it. If, if your boy comes, Mama, I feel like I'm a girl. Say, Baal, get out of here, Baal. Don't even try to cancel. Why do you feel like a boy? You are a girl. No, baby. That's. <laughs> well, I just feel like a girl. You, you need to say, Bell. <laughs> really, Bell? You're going to do that to my child? I, someone said, Boo devil, I see you. <laughs> say, Boo devil, I see you. I'm showing you how to change people around. If you understand what's behind the veil, you can change the conversations in front of the veil. <laughs> Baal. Baal. That's what he did to people. Baal. In the Bible, I don't want to offend anybody, but in the Bible, you all, in the Bible, do you know, in the Bible, you just watch the Bible and also read ancient texts. That what you call the, the gay lifestyle was the most prominent way to worship Baal in Baal temples. So how can a lifestyle that appeared in the, in the temple of Baal become a lifestyle God endorses tomorrow? I don't care what you say, homosexuality in scripture and by historical documents was connected to Baal. You got brothers that are struggling, just talk to Baal. Don't try to convince them. They won't listen to you because they are, when Baal is in them, they are attendants to Baal and their lifestyle is how they worship him and give him offerings. Until you deal with Baal, they're going to tell you, I was born this way. Because the altar will speak and defend the offering and then protect the attendant. So you deal with the altar. That's, and we have a prophet, I just gave you a prophetic, the Bible just gave us a, a prophetic pattern of how to deal with people who are addicted to altars. You don't talk to them, you speak to the altar. <laughs> the prophet never argued with the king. 
He didn't tell the king, what you're doing is wrong, man. You are the king. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. No, he bypassed the attendant, spoke to the altar. That's what I'm doing tonight. I'm just bypassing everything and speaking to the altar. You don't think those altars are hearing me? Oh, you better believe it when you see how changed your life will be by tomorrow. Let's stand up and divorce Baal. Say, Heavenly Father, I know that I live in America where Baal worship is very prevalent. So at some point, I may have touched that worship. I may have connected with people who are, who are worshiping Baal. So Heavenly Father, as I come before you, I'm asking you, God, to, uh, to forgive me and cleanse me from anything I have in common with the altar of Baal that can give him power to control my fertility, to control my sexuality. Heavenly Father, I renounce Baal. I'm asking you, God, that you divorce me right now from this demonic God called Baal in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, any altar to Baal that my bloodline opened themselves up to, I'm asking God that you close the door as you deliver me in my soul, in my DNA, and in my bloodline. I'm asking God that you send the angels to destroy every altar to Baal. In the name of Jesus, I declare and declare as from today, I am free from the influence of Baal. In Jesus' name, Lord, I declare that Jesus is setting me free from the altar of Baal in my bloodline, in my soul, in my DNA. Put it out. The Lord says, Francis, some of the proof that you have been delivered from Baal for the women is that your monthly periods will become painless. God said to me, I don't, in, uh, it's not me, it's Baal claiming the rights of fertility because altars become more powerful in you when there is a bloodshed. The highest offering you can give an altar is blood. This is another God that America, this God has actually overtaken Baal in America, Molech. This altar has overtaken. Do you know that there is, do you know that there is a political party that will throw the gays under the bus if they had to choose between them and abortion? That means Molech has become more powerful now in America. Who was Molech? God speaks about Molech a lot. When God, when God who made the universe addresses something again and again, it's a real force and a real power. In the book of Jeremiah 32, 35, the Bible says they built high places for worship of Baal in the valley of Benihinom to make their sons and their daughters pass through the fire to do what? To worship and honor Molech, which I had not commanded them, neither did it enter my mind that they should do such a repulsive thing. I don't care what you call it, abortion is repulsive to God. Giving your the bloods, giving the bloods of the fetuses, the bloods of your children to an idol. God says this is repulsive to me. So who was Molech? Molech was an ancient god of the Ammonites. And you know the do you know the most common offering the Ammonites gave to, to Molech? They would take their children and cut them up. 
and then throw them. Thousands of children will be cut up and thrown on the altar of Molech. This is how they worship Molech. You in America, you call it being pro-choice, but it's a worship of Molech. Are you catching what I'm saying? It's a worship of Molech. And if you have ever committed an abortion, then Molech has rule over you until you repent. If you have somebody in your, in your family who has ever done abortion, then the, then the altar of Molech is in the bloodline. And we're going to deal with it. As a matter of fact, it's because of Molech that many of you, remember Molech, because, is a, because Molech demands the death of children, that means their destinies are aborted before what? Time. Therefore, Molech is also the God who aborts projects, destinies. <laughs> you begin something, it's aborted. It's because Molech is in the bloodline. God tells you, this is your business. Five months later, it's closed. Molech is in the bloodline. I can guarantee you, if you look back, Molech, if there's an abortion, Molech is involved. Some of you, you'd be millionaires right now, but every venture is aborted because Molech is in the bloodline. But today, Molech is about to live. Yeah. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, as I stand before you, I renounce the worship of Molech. First over America, I repent that our nation has given, our, has given millions of our babies to Molech, this ancient idol of the Ammonites. Heavenly Father, I repent on behalf of America. But Heavenly Father, anything I have in common with the altar of Molech. In Jesus' name, I am asking, Lord, that you'd wash me by the blood of Jesus, that I would have nothing in my soul, in my DNA, in my bloodline, that is connected to the worship of Molech. In the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, I repent for any life that has ever been aborted, by anybody in my bloodline who carries my DNA. I'm asking God that you'd forgive us. You'd forgive them in Jesus' name. So Father, even as I've repented for members of my family that have committed an abortion, I declare and decree that from going forward, more like cannot abort anything that has to do with my life. For today, the Lord Jesus, by his angels, is delivering me in my DNA, in my bloodline, in my soul, from the altar of Molech. Put it out! Somebody shout, no more abortions. Somebody say, no more abortions. Whatever I give birth to now shall come to full term. Then there was the altar of the Asherah. Altar of the Asherah. Whatever you find bare of the Asherah, it was known as a feminine, feminine deity. She was the female version of Baal. Have you ever seen in Las Vegas the poor dancers? The poor dancers, it was the worship of Asherah. The way that Asherah was a pole, was an idol shaped in the size of a pole. That's where the pole dancing comes from. So the Asherah is the idol over sexual promiscuity. And boy, is it in the church. People coming on Sundays by shaking up every day. That is the worship of Asherah. Oh, I just love my boyfriend. Well, if he's not your husband, you're sleeping with him, then Asherah is who you are worshiping. I don't care what you say, because Asherah was over sexual promiscuity. Come on, somebody. Are you catching what I'm saying? You see, there is a way these idols are worshipped. I don't care what you say. If you're having sex out of the covenant of marriage, you are worshipping the idol called Asherah. <laughs> to God, these things are very simple. They are very simple. 
to the Lord. You make it difficult, but to God, he's all about the battle of altars. What altar? Because when you're sleeping with a man who's not your husband or a woman who's not your wife, here's what God is asking. Here's what, here's what God is asking himself. While you're on the bed doing all that stuff, God is simply asking, okay, uh, they are not married, so I know the Holy Ghost didn't put them in bed. So which means what altar? Put them in bed. Whatever altar put them in bed, that's the God they are worshiping in their sexual act. That's why sex between a husband and a woman is worshipped to God. You know why it's worshipped to God? Because, that he, because he put you on the bed together. Therefore shall a man and a wife come together and the two shall become one. And God said they were both naked and it was beautiful. So when you take a somebody who's not your wife and you go on the bed, oh, can I tell you, this will blow your mind. Okay, sex, all sex is connected to an altar. Because sex is an altar. How do you prove it? Altars are places of exchange. So the, the man gives the woman a seed, the woman comes up with a baby, there was an exchange. That's why altars love sexuality. Why do you think sexuality is a big deal? Why do you think pedophilia in your country is so big? Because sexuality is, the, is one of the most powerful ways to quickly establish an order. And the God behind that is Asherah. And the Bible, or Ashtaroth. Stand up. Let's deal with, this is the last day. Come on somebody. You are going to struggle with the spirit of lust. I hope you can celebrate that. I said this is the last day. You are going to struggle with the spirit of lust. You know what last is? Is an altar calling you to bed. So the altar and the God behind it can possess you when you answer the call. Okay, let's finish the service. Say, Heavenly Father, as I'm in the court of heaven, I ask for your righteous judgment over my DNA over my bloodline, over my soul, concerning the, the altar of Asherah. Heavenly Father, I renounce this altar that generates impure sexual thoughts and energies. I refuse to be controlled by impure sexual thoughts and the energies that are calling me to bed at the violation of the covenant of marriage. So Heavenly Father, anything I have in common, in my DNA, in my soul, in my bloodline, with the altar of Asherah, I ask Jesus to cleanse me, to deliver me in the name of Jesus. I renounce this idol and the altar it stands on in Jesus' name. Lord Jesus, I'm asking you now, I'm asking you now to deliver me in my DNA, in my soul, and in my bloodline from the altar of the Asherah. Put it out! Mama, 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 mama. Hey! Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Now the Lord said to me, now Francis just called out, showed out the altars. He said, do them, man. do them together. We are at that place. Just, now say, say, Heavenly Father, right now, I, as I'm in the court of heaven, in the day of judgment, for you have chosen tonight, as a moment of Kairos, to judge every evil altar that has harassed me, oppressed me, used me, controlled me. Heavenly Father, I renounce the altar of the goddess Diana. I denounce 
this idol that makes people worship their own image. I renounce it in the name of Jesus. Anything I have in common with this altar in my soul, in my DNA, I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, to cleanse me by the blood and deliver me. I renounce the altar of Dagon, this water spirit God, in Jesus' name, the spirit behind wet dreams at night. I will not be, I will not be raped sexually in my sleep, in my dreams by Dagon. It's over in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, anything I have in common in my soul, in my DNA, in my bloodline, with the author of Dagon, I ask Jesus, my Lord, to cleanse me by his blood until there's nothing that connects me to Dagon and the altar thereof. I renounce the altar of Behezabab, the spirit that is behind mental confusion. Heavenly Father, I renounce Behezabab, the Lord of the flies, things that fly around the mind. I declare and decree that Behezabab will no longer attack my time of prayer by causing all kind of thoughts to fly around my head like flies until I cannot concentrate on my God. So Jesus, anything I have in common in my DNA, in my soul, in my bloodline, with the altar of Beelzebub, I say, Jesus, wash me clean by your blood, that there'll be nothing that connects us. Heavenly Father, I renounce the altar of Babel, the tower of Babel, which is an altar to self-worship. That altar that causes self to rise up as though it was God in pride. I renounce it. I will no longer be controlled by this evil altar. Lord Jesus, anything I have in common in my bloodline, in my soul, in my DNA, with the towel of Babel, I'm asking you, Lord, that you deliver me and cleanse me from it. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, I renounce the altar of Cain, an altar of defiance that calls Cain to point his finger as, at God. As a mere man, he rebuked God. Lord, that altar of defiance that can challenge your authority. I'm asking you, God, and anything I have in common with that altar of defiance in my DNA, in my soul, in my bloodline, Lord Jesus, cleanse me by your blood from any connection with these evil altars. In Jesus' name, I declare, I declare, that angels, angels are busy destroying, shutting down these evil altars in my DNA, in my soul, in my bloodline. Now pull them out! Shout, pull them out! Father, I command every evil altar, come out, come out! Let the people of God go oh my god you know what I'm seeing in the spirit I'm seeing stones rolled over 
stones rolled over, heaps of stones. And God said, angels with sledgehammers, I've been busy tonight. I've been busy tonight. Somebody shout, I'm free. I'm free. I am free. free. Now listen, we're about to end the service with this. Pastor Chris, get ready because we're going to do a champion to end the service tonight. Are you ready for righteous orders to get into you now? This is an application, an activation service. Come on, somebody. The Bible says these are the, because me, these are, these are the altars I want you to release in my people. It says, as you do, these platforms, because altars are platforms, these altars, these, these APIs are going to be released. Okay? That means you're going to be connected to the technology they represent in the spirit. And things that that altar did for the people who built them, they will do for you. Because altars do not die. Come on, somebody. And come on, some, righteous altars get neglected, but they don't die. Evil orders can be destroyed until they are no more. But righteous orders never die. I said, Lord, why don't righteous orders never die? He says, because, he said to me, he says, Francis, it's because they are the Lord's inheritance for his people. I used to think, now everything has changed about my life. Now when I look at this, God said to me, Francis, you read those scriptures before. And you, you, may, you privatized what you are reading to the person building the altar. You did not know the altar was being built for the family. The altar was being built for the family. And the voice of that altar still speaks. The problem is I'm waiting for my children to come to Bethel and touch the altar. Come on, somebody. The altar, Jacob didn't build the altar. He inherited it. <laughs> Abram built it. Abram died. The altar kept speaking. The altar kept speaking. Angels kept going up and down. But the altar was waiting for a member of the family. <laughs> To just bump into it. And everything the altar did for your father Abraham, it begins to do for you in McDonald today. Saturday. So the altar, God said to me, release these altars. Can I release them now? They are righteous altars. They are angels who are about to release them into your DNA. They begin to work for you and you're going to see these things. He said to me, Francis, let me, he says, release the, the Noah's altar. I said, God, what is Noah's altar? Here's what the Bible, I'm going to read about the righteous altars. I'm going to read the scripture that goes with them because you've got to hear the altars. Because altars tell you what they are by what they do. I'm going to read. And Noah, Genesis 8, 20 to 21. And the Bible says, and Noah built an altar to the Lord. Is that right? And took of every clean ceremonial animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, a soothing, satisfying scent. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground. Somebody shout with me. I will never again curse the ground. I will never again curse the ground. <laughs> Remember... Wealth is the soil. We heard it in the break. I will never again curse the wealth of the soil from coming to my people. Listen to me. Come on, somebody. Amen. I mean, one Noah's Noah. God said to me, the altar of Noah is the altar that reverses every curse that stops the land from producing. It's not that somebody wanted. That somebody wanted. Stand up and just grab it. Say, Lord, I receive. Tell them, put it in me. Say, Lord, I receive. Noah's order that reverses the curse on the ground I need for increase. So every curse that taught, the, that taught the land I couldn't have my blessing, that curse, come and do this. What can I say? He has been reversed. Give God a shout, America is about to bless you. Noah's altar is now yours. How many are ready for Abraham's altar? Abraham arrives in the promised land. 
And the Bible says, Genesis 12, he built an altar, Linda. He built an altar. The Bible says when he arrived, there were enemies in the land God had promised him. So what does he do? Does he fight them with a gun? That's not right. What does he do? He builds an altar. An altar. Ah, an altar. Somebody is living in your house. But an altar is about to release your house. Somebody is driving your car, but they are about to leave it. Because right now, say Jesus, put Abraham's altar into me now. I said, Lord, he said to me, the altar of Abraham is the altar that allows you to possess your possessions. Slap somebody and say, I'm possessing my possessions. Everything with my name on it is coming to me. Every contract, every deal, every house, every car, every plane that's got my name on it is coming to me. I'll possess my possession. Stay out, receive. Grab it, grab it, grab it. Grab your possession. Grab your house. Grab your house. Grab your husband. Grab your wife. Grab your children. Possess your possessions. Abraham, our daddy. Someone say, Abraham is my daddy. Turn to one and say, is, is it neighbor? Papa left me some stuff. Abraham built another altar. The altar he built was Mount Moriah. When God says, Abraham, he says, yes, here I am. He says, Abraham, offer me Isaac. Shakatara. Your only son. And this old man did not even doubt, not even argue with God. And he went to Mount Moriah. And there at Mount Moriah, he built an altar. The boy understands the law of altars. So he turns to his father. He says, my father, I see the wood. I see everything needed to build an altar is with us. But, but the boy understood, being a break, that no altar comes alive without a sacrifice. He says, where is the sacrifice? Later he would find out he was the sacrifice. <laughs> Somebody's about to be so blessed. Somebody's about to be so blessed. And then he put the boy on it. And then God spoke. He said, Abraham, don't do it. For now we know that you fear God. And then something happened, Apostle Lee. God identified the name of the altar to Abraham. I know we sing songs every Sunday. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. My provider. And the Lord told me, he says, Francis, that's not accurate. Jehovah Jireh is not my name. It's the name of an altar. It's in your Bible. Genesis 22 verse 4. And Abraham called that place Jehovah Jireh. What altar is this that's about to come into you? It's the altar where you stop running for money. Money chases you. Somebody touch your back. If you are feeling something, that's your car chasing you. If you are feeling something, that's your house chasing you. The Bible says at this altar, my father Abraham turned and God says, look behind you. If I'm looking behind you, whatever is caught behind me, I am not the hunter. Somebody's hunting on my behalf. 
I'm here to tell somebody while you are in this building, God is hunting for your new car. Come on, somebody. <laughs> while you are in this place, God is hunting for your new house. Somebody shout and say, Jesus, put the outer out Mount Moriah in me. Come on. Say, put it in me and give him a shout. <laughs> Some of you, when you come in February, you'll be like, Dr. Mouse, you, you ought to come outside and see the right Jesus got me. I, I was not even looking for it. That altar is working. Some of you, the devil has weared you out, chasing stuff that ought to be chasing you. Today, God says, I changed the technology of your provision. It is time money chased you for a while. Give God a shout. Jacob's altar. Do you know Jacob built an altar? Do you know what did Jacob's altar do? When Jacob built an altar, he built it because he was terrified of the Gentiles around him. They were savages. They had no law like you have today. He had women and children. Didn't have an army like Father Abraham. So, per apostle, he was scared they might rape his daughters or kill him at best because he, he was rich. And he was moving. He was an open target. He's terrified. What are they going to do when they come? I look at what I have. And God said, "Put an altar." And he built an altar. And the Bible said, "When after he finished building the altar, he says the Gentile nations heard a troop of angels. A troop of angels." Jacob's altar is the altar that releases angels in your life. Somebody, you're about to see more angels in your life than you've ever seen before. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I see angels in, walking in out of your house. You better get used because when Jacob's altar comes into you, don't freak out when you go to the bathroom at night and the angel is saying, okay, hello, how about you? What? No. I'm here because you got Jacob's altar. It brings angels into your house. Somebody receive it. Jacob's altar. Somebody say, God.